Hello and welcome to another edition of Times of India's Mission Admission, where we explore college and career options for students. I'm Kamini Matai, your host for today. And this, this initiative is powered by Savita College of Architecture and Design. So in today's session, we turn the spotlight on architecture. And we have with us Sriram Ganapati, Managing Director, KSM Architecture, Tyre Zoyer, co-founder of the Triple O Studio, and Durganand Balsavar, Dean and Professor of Savita College of Architecture and Design. So our panelists are going to speak on everything from varied career paths that a basic degree in architecture can throw open to a future in the field. So now that you have the master plan for the session, to those tuned in, send your questions in to the comment section. Okay, so we'll begin. Uh, Professor Durganand, if we could start with you. Um, so you were saying that today's architecture courses are very different to what they were earlier. I mean, the specializations that they have now and, you know, with times changing, especially. So you were saying, for instance, that the pandemic has brought healthcare architecture into focus and some you even have art direction as one of the specializations. So if you could tell us about how architecture as a course itself has changed over the years. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, I must thank the Times Group for providing a platform to parents and students to really know what the profession or discipline of architecture is about. I think we need many more such sessions. I thank architect Sriram Ganapati and uh, Tahir Zoeb, uh, who, are, <clears throat> who have been practicing in Chennai, very thinking practices that we respect. And we've been in dialogue on these issues because these are challenging times. It's the pandemic, the challenging times. But before we get into that, I thought maybe a broader discussion on what architecture is about you know, and what does it entail? What, are the, what is the future? What is the course like? I think may kind of bring some light before we get into the other issues. Uh, for us personally, architecture, I find gives a lot of freedom. Freedom of imagination, freedom of new ideas, freedom of because the minute we talk design, we're really talking uh, about the future, about a better future. That's why we design, you know? And that's one of the primary roles of an architect, where, he, where the architect combines creativity with pragmatism. You know, it's, a, it's like an art and science combination. But therefore, because it is interdisciplinary as a discipline itself, it provides a lot of scope. Uh, primarily, of course, it's about design of aspirations, ideas. We may want a wonderful home. We desire a wonderful airport. We desire a wonderful uh, cultural center or even just landscapes. So I think the range is diverse. You know, in, in the 80s, there was a credo which we can bring, a, bring back that an architect really deals with right from a doorknob to an entire city. And that's the scale at which an architect really can engage. You know? And if I can briefly, and then I would invite the other panelists to enrich this. Briefly, what has happened is because of the pandemic, healthcare has come to the fore. And uh, for us at the Savita University, having <clears throat> had a very strong base in healthcare, we found it very enriching to actually begin to discuss with doctors and we know the country's healthcare infrastructure needs improvement. So that's become one of the core areas of the education process. At the same time, opportunities like this, I mean, we would never have imagined four years ago a digital conversation. We would have met at some auditorium or, um, and th these digital conversations are now becoming primary, which means that we need to discover new ways of engaging with digital technologies while re reinforcing our real life as well. Because this is a virtual world, how do you really combine the virtual and the real has opened many new possibilities. And through the next hour, I would open it, right? I'll leave it for a later discussion. In the, but I think digital healthcare and the fact that today architects are being invited into very, very new areas, whether it is the gaming world, whether it is multimedia, whether it is, uh, many of them are becoming IS officers today because of the infrastructure projects. And I think the range that and scope that an architectural education has today is much wider than the practice per se. In fact, practices themselves, I would say Sriram's practice and Tahir's practice themselves 
have kind of broadened the scope beyond what we understood architecture maybe 10 or 15 years ago you know so that i would say is the broad uh, substrate on which we could build on and then i would come back later in in in, in kind of adding more into this yeah so sriram or yeah, thank you, thank uh, you. professor uh, uh, sahib you you teach architecture as well so you were saying that you know could you tell us how the sort of the scope of architecture has changed in the in the last few years um yeah for, i think all of us uh, uh, are academicians as, as as well and i think uh, what uh, i think before i maybe uh, talk about what has changed i'd like to share uh, my own personal journey through the course and i'm pretty sure i speak for most of us when i say that this is probably a good journey what i think uh, is really beautiful about the five years of formal architectural education is that it throws you into context that you would not normally uh, you know engage with it puts you into uh, say a, a, a rural context it puts you into a urban context it makes you engage with people with uh, you know society and culture and understand the nuances of all of this and i think uh, from that perspective you end up having a very a strong core set of say ideologies by the end of the five years which then allow you to ask yourself where do i now want to go with this you can choose to say i i love spatial quality i'd like to continue designing buildings or building spaces and creating wonderful interiors and so on and like Durganan said it could be from a donor to large scale city level uh, interventions uh, and having said that I know other people who are into movies into gaming into other avenues that architecture has truly kindled to enable because a lot of us especially if we are in the 11th and 12th we may understand that there's a there's some aspects of creativity within us that we want to explore and pursue. And we're not always, we haven't defined it very clearly by that age. We're still, you know, it's, it's still a little cloudy in our heads. And from that perspective, I think architecture offers uh, through the five years an amazing platform for you to not just hone your drawing skills, but to hone your digital skills, to engage with so many diverse groups of people. And it uh, one of the other things that offers a lot of, I think, confidence, at least on a personal level, is I used to have a lot of stage fright. I, I couldn't uh, have ever fathomed being on a panel like this at one point in time. Uh, I think all of that completely went out of the window when I was thrown into the deep end and said, here, present your designs to people like uh, Sri Ram, present your designs to people like Durgan and, and, and have a healthy, meaningful dialogue. So all of this greatly improves when confidence is as well. And today, I mean, I'm really proud of where we've come over the last uh, eight to 10 years as a practice. And if I can be very candid, uh, designing buildings is maybe five to 10% of what we do uh, in our studio. So, and again, that is all thanks to architecture and all thanks to studying architecture. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't think I answered your question though. I, okay. I, I will it's a good, it's a get good back start. to it at some point. <laughs> It's a good start. Uh, Sriram, your firm is 30 years old. Uh, so is that itself, could you throw, us, throw some light on, you know, how, you know, the whole concept has sort of changed, you know, of, of architecture over three decades? Um, yeah. Then and now, kind of. Yeah, so the thing is, um, yeah, when you, when you talk about the age of a firm, only when you say it's 30 years old, I just you know, stop and say, oh my gosh, that's like quite a few years, right? It's quite old, but um, there, is a, there is a freshness to uh, architecture and design um, that, um, uh, that, you know, it, it doesn't dull with age. Uh, every day in, in your architecture design career, is a fresh new day and uh, every design you work on is a fresh start. There are no set formulae uh, that you can you know, fall back upon and say, okay, we have done this in this manner, so we just you know, motor along and apply that formula and then boom, the design is done. It never works that way. And uh, as a professional, as a design professional, you always want to create something uh, better than your previous uh, 
no, design project. So, um, so that's the uh, nature of the game. So, you know, uh, in fact, uh, Durganand and I, uh, both of us started our careers the same, uh, uh, the Mecca of Indian architecture, as many people would call it, with P.V. Uh, Doshi. And um, he is, what, 95 years old. And we just met him a few years ago, I'm saying about five, five, four, five years ago. And he was talking about uh, the uh, kind of design he intends to do in the next 10, 15 years. He said, now this is the kind of work I want to do at the age of 90. So I guess a designer, an architect, believes that he live to be 200. And uh, he would just keep, he or she would just keep uh, creating new, uh, coming up with new ideas and thoughts as they go along. Having said that, you know, there is, uh, the thing is, the study of architecture is very vast, like what Bhutan is talking about and uh, what Tahir is also saying. Uh, the emphasis is, uh, because the education itself is so varied, there are so many, so multidisciplinary that the emphasis is on self-learning and the need to uh, absorb information from all the resources around you. So uh, the study calls for uh, a lot of creativity, for sure, uh, industry, and uh, often long periods of struggle and uncertainty, because you're, you're, you're in the process of creating something, you're designing something, you're coming up with something which probably did, doesn't exist. So uh, obviously there is going to be a lot of uncertainty, a lot of struggle in your mind, uh, which is why some people say, I think we spoke about it some time ago that you know, our, our architects very stressed. Yes, we do a lot of thinking. So you know, uh, that would uh, mean that there is some amount of stress, but at the same time, architecture and design can be very satisfying, especially when um, an architect or designer visualizes and designs a, a built form or or a garden or any space and uh, conceives the design and then when physically it is manifested, you know, it's a tremendous feeling of satisfaction. And then you grade yourself and say, did I do a good job? Did it really come out as well as uh, intended? Um, and, you know, has it, has it achieved what it needs to do for the people who are going to be using it? Are they happy in the space that you have created and so on? So it's, it's a very different kind of a journey as compared to many other professions because you know, you're constantly engaging with your profession, with your, your creations, your buildings, your spaces, and the people who are using them. And you want to make it a, a better place to live in, a better place to work in, a better place to sleep, or study, or play. In. So uh, that's the uh, constant, what shall we say, engagement that an architect or a designer has. And um, anyone stepping into this uh, profession, you, know, uh, you just have to be aware that there is a, a whole lot of uh, fun. At the same time, there's a lot of work and uh, it's not a bed of roses. It's very hard. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of hard work, but it's enjoyable. And uh, probably that's the bottom line as far as uh, architecture is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Sriram. Um, Professor uh, Durganand, I just wanted to ask you, so do you think architecture today then is more, is the course more about design than architecture? I mean, just building buildings. I mean, do you, where do you see your architecture students today? Are all of them, you know, into buildings or what are, what are they doing? I would say, I would say that uh, <clears throat> it's more about a temper or an attitude to thinking, you know, uh, it's a design thinking. And what design thinking entails is a very sharp uh, engagement with our five senses. So it's almost like dealing with the core of survival, where we start celebrating these five senses. Because in today's world, uh, I think the need to celebrate or understand that the human being has these five senses. And so if we look at a film by Mr. Maniratnam, he's celebrating the five senses. If we looked at uh, Federer playing the Wimbledon, he's celebrating the five senses. And what the architecture course itself does is awaken this five senses. You know, it, it cannot be only an intellectual approach. So let's say in our schools, uh, the young students, and we have, we have a lot of international programs. So we have architects from Germany, Southeast Asia coming in. 
and the Indian Institute of Architects have been very supportive. Arkesha has been supportive. Industry has been supportive. Uh, I recall we had invited Sri Ram at the end of the first year, you know, last year, just before the pandemic to the school to review and discuss. So it's really a very creatively collaborative kind of a process over the five years. And through the awakening of these five senses, I think logical power, deep thinking, almost like chess and deep thinking, uh, creativity, the artistic all begin to kind of unfold. And as Tahir rightly said, many of us developed our storytelling or communication skills in the schools of architecture because the story or the narrative, you know, with all these emotions, aspirations. Now, let's say somebody came down and said, design a three bedroom uh, bungalow for me. It's not a three bedroom bungalow, it's a dream. Somebody is coming and placing a dream on a table and uh, how does one conjure a dream collaboratively with, and I think that's where the architect becomes a dream finder or, a, you know, so there are, there are all these layers of imaginations. And I have many friends now who are in Hollywood, some are with Mr. Mani Ratnam, some are looking at uh, being IS officers. There are IS officers who are architects now. So I think what they tell me is that, let's assume that there is a commissioner who, who was earlier a veterinary doctor and then becomes a commissioner of a, a city. And he has to look at infrastructure projects. It's not easy. It's not easy because then he has to depend on the architectural fraternity to take judgments. But when an architect becomes an IS officer and becomes a commissioner, you have several cases today, Curitiba in Brazil, where IME Learner has be was an architect, wrote in the paper like Times every Sunday in the supplement, and suddenly got elected by accident. He just stood by accident and an architect is elected to make changes and improve the city. You know? So I think they're better placed because of the appreciation of human desire and aspiration, as well as very pragmatic needs of how to build uh, light, ventilation, durability. And it's, it's really an interdisciplinary course and lends itself, therefore lends itself to several other areas. Envi environmental activists, activists in the UN now who are architects. And uh, Simon and Garfunkel were architects. They were musicians. Uh, Asterix, the two authors of Asterix, I had the opportunity of meeting one of them in Paris, is an architect. So you see the Asterix comics are so well articulated you know, in terms of the space and we enjoy aesthetics, but they are architects. So I think that kind of a grounding, it's a temper, it's a state, it's a creative state of mind. And the course itself is structured in a way that it allows this awakening. And, and yes, I think if a student is enjoying architecture and immerses all these other discussions on even someone saying stress or this and that, I think life is meant for all that. Uh, it kind of subsumes all that in the creativity in your charge. So I think that kind of a approach and uh, inviting foreign architects, inviting uh, architects from India. So the students really are talking to them. They have a role model. They're seeing the kind of work, a lot of travel. So one goes to these amazing places as Tahir was saying. So we go to Jaipur, we fascinate. You go to a, a thousand year old structure and wonder how did they even build it? So there is a lot of mystery, fascination, uh, which builds itself, up, builds itself up to this kind of a narrative. And the narrative then opens out into, today I know architects in the US being invited into MIT and Princeton to work on the artificial intelligence programs, just because of the lateral thinking that the course provides. And I think that kind of, a, like for instance, Cambridge University now has collaborated and signed a MOU with Savita Architecture because they want to look at agriculture and architecture. Now, this was signed pre-pandemic. And so we have adopted 15 villages now. And the students are not looking at architecture alone. They're looking at the intersection, which means, let's say there's rice husk waste in the village. And now the architects are sitting with our engineering department and the liberal arts to see whether we could make bricks out of rice husk. Now, that was such a waste. So I think these kind of collaborative practices and I would, to dispel certain doubts, I would say those who are working in these kind of creative intersections, even in terms of remuneration, 
the remuneration is good because there are doubts that get created on the remuneration. So those who have broken these boundaries, and I think the five-year course allows you to break these boundaries pretty easily. Uh, those who have broken these boundaries, I think the remuneration they're very happy with is on par with any other industry. And I think that's the kind of, but if someone went the conventional way and limited their scope and uh, narrowed it and boxed themselves in, I think then there's no discussion on remuneration because uh, that's in any field, any field. But this course, I remember my, I have a very close lawyer friend, very famous, and he would tell me, I wish I had done architecture. With the law and justice, I'm just caught with this and going to the high court, coming back or Supreme Court. But architecture, really talking about life, you're talking about construction, you're talking about material, you're talking about stories. And then within that, each is unique to choose their own path. But what happens is the course is broad enough for each to choose their own path. I have friends who are into wildlife. Now they feel they should do architecture or relate to the architecture only of animals, you know, and learn from it. And I think that's another completely new area where architects are being invited to work in because of the ecological crisis, biodiversity crisis, all linked to environment, all linked to our relationship of how humans are building, whether we are building sensitively or we're building crudely where we destroy the environment. You know, I think those are the challenges which get brought up and more importantly, debated. There's no final answer. I think the debate of saying, this is what I feel, that is what I feel. And in conversations like this, like this platform itself, I think this is a very important architectural uh, expression you know, in this conversation where Sri Ram is giving a point of view, Tahir is giving a completely different point of view and all seem to be right, but they enrich our understanding of what we can do in the world what is the meaning that I have. And I would, I would like to reiterate here that in these areas, the remuneration is on par with any other industry. And I think there are several places vacant to be filled in these areas. So there is a big demand, let's say healthcare. There's a huge demand for state of art hospitals and there are no architects. Uh, there is, so I think that, that's the lacuna which the universities and the practice can fill. There's a big demand, and that is why I would I would again place on record here that these are the areas we need to discuss. So this is broadly, it. and then we can come back to these in more detail. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Tahir. Could you uh, tell us what are the skill sets that you know a budding architect would need? You were talking about sketching, not you know sketching not being as important as everybody uh, you know stresses. So could you tell us a little bit about what so you this, feel are the skills? Uh, that? Slight disclaimer there. I, I will say uh, being good at sketching is definitely a bonus. You uh, changed that from yesterday. But I, uh, <laughs> that's the disclaimer. I, I'm not going to say... Uh, so on a personal level, I am terrible at sketching. And I can say that with confidence because of the panelists that I have in front of me. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, But having said that, I do think if you have... Uh, a, a talent to express yourself through, uh, you know, any manual means. It doesn't have to only be sketching. It can be making of physical models. It can be, you know, just basically using your your hands as the tool, you know, uh, and uh, being able to communicate through this medium is a big bonus because in a sense, you have a really good springboard to kind of dive into this course. Having said that, uh, the course itself is designed currently in such a way that you really, uh, after say two to three years of the course, if say uh, those who are uh, extremely skilled at sketching, they will definitely, in my opinion, do quite well in the initial stages. But after a certain point, it does become a very level playing field. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting there is that there is a emphasis and there's a need to also think of digital tools and how best to use them to practice architecture or to design anything for that matter. And I think as soon as that comes into the equation, the playing field does level out in a certain way. And I would argue that you don't necessarily have to be able to you know, sketch the Mona Lisa. As long as you are able to communicate to the person sitting across the table or to the person that you know, you're having a dialogue with, that this is what I want to tell you. 
through this you know scribble or through x y z i think that is what is the most important uh, in my opinion what about uh, you shri ram would you like to add to this what do you think are the skill sets that you know uh, a person who wants to do architecture needs yeah <clears throat> this is my personal opinion because uh, uh, again we come from a different generation um, there is always this aptitude test that you know we talk about that whether a person has the aptitude for architecture and uh, uh, <clears throat> it is the test is governed by drawing freehand drawing to see if you can visualize or draw something out of your mind and stuff like that uh, <clears throat> well it's a good uh, skill to have but like i was saying there's just the computer has has just replaced uh, so many drawing uh, tools and methods of drawing that you know people are able to it just becomes an extension of your hand really so there are people who draw a lot but what i would like to bring uh, here on the table is that it's the attitude which is more important uh, in my opinion than the a uh, real aptitude for architecture it's just a very slight uh, difference the uh, when i say attitude i just mean that a person's mind has to be very open open to uh, absorb as many thoughts and uh, uh, you know the the information that's around you you need to absorb that and uh, not be very set in your in your ways and the uh, the appetite to do uh, a lot of work hard work honest work on on a particular project or on, on a particular thought process um so the attitude is important you should be interested or develop interest in what you're doing so i might have a great hand and i might be able to draw very well but if i don't have the right attitude i might just say okay this few scribbles over here are good enough for me to get my marks and if you if you are in that kind of a mode then then you're losing your battle there is a person who cannot draw but has the attitude to say i want to excel in this i want to do something really special i want to create something special doesn't matter i can't draw but maybe i could use a computer to do it maybe i could make a model to communicate this idea so it's the development of skills is what uh, one of the primary things that you learn when you are in your course of architecture but uh, developing your mind and the attitude to design attitude to do architecture and design is really the key and uh, the course of architecture is probably honing those uh, skills and uh, talents hidden talents that you have uh, not necessarily a physical uh, talent of being able to draw really well and things so it is definitely an asset for sure it is but um it can be developed as we go along so that's that's my uh, uh, two pennies in this thank you uh, thank you shira so we've got some questions that have come in from the audience but before that uh, professor durganand could you tell us a little about the eligibility criteria for a student sure. who sure. wants to go into architecture you know what is the exam they have to do or... sure sure i think uh one thing is that the nata exam which is conducted by the council of architecture you can google nata and you'll get the registration for the nata is absolutely mandatory so i request all parents and students who not registered for the nata there's a last chance to register now and on 3rd of september of the next month is the final exam uh, it's absolutely mandatory because every day we get several students coming onto our campus uh, saying that they didn't know that they have to register for the nata and i think the nata is absolutely mandatory and uh, one has to and the nata also measures aptitude uh, in its own way and the aptitude kind of combines cognitive thinking imagination logic and uh, certain mathematical capabilities so given that since you were discussing skill sets i'm just making uh, i've never given this analogy but today when they were tahir and sri ram were discussing i wondered whether to test this analogy i hope it works uh, in terms of skill sets 
I was just wondering that as a young child, I would watch a cricket match, you know, or even later you watch, you watch Gavaskar, you watch, uh, <clears throat> you watch, Street, you watch uh, Sachin Tendulkar, you watch Dhoni, and you suddenly see they're all a team playing and a team winning for India. But I think if they were to be asked, what is the skill set for a cricketer? I think a wicket keeper would have another kind of skill set he would develop. An opening batsman would develop one kind of skill set. Uh, an opening bowler or a spinner would develop. And I think that's the kind of range that even an architect, once he realizes his strengths, can reorganize his skill sets to kind of deliver within this larger firmament of architecture. You know? So I have found, but personally I found that, uh, so what we tell students is if you pass Nata, you come in. You have five years to enjoy to learn your sketching. You need not stress out and have sleepless nights on it. Because I think once you come in, you're a little relaxed, you start drawing. And the whole environment, everyone is enjoying and drawing. It's like a festival. I have seen drawing improves. Uh, drawing comes out well. It's generally all in the mind. I may have a diffidence. Or I may not want to spend too much time improving my drawing. But it's not something as difficult as... Uh, landing on the moon you know i think it's it's a very uh, intuitive and i have seen in fact i don't want to mention but many of famous film directors have secretly shown me their uh, sketches that they make before the film is shot and uh, almost being diffident that the sketches are bad and they're showing an architect and, but the objective of that sketching is so that they can imagine a scene in a light. The objective is not to make a good drawing to be sold for $9 million. You know? So the objective itself is different. And they are able to have a shorthand in sketching, which is amazing. And the sketches to a common eye or a fine art person will look really bad. But to that uh, eminent film director, he knows if he sketched in this way, he wants the 345 light coming in on the face of the hero in this way. It should be a space of four meters. And I think he conjures that. So it becomes sketching, becomes a kind of a shorthand for architects to kind of keep in their mind and access it to kind of then conjure these great spaces. Sketching is not an end in itself. But to someone who is a fine art person or an artist, of course, sketching may be an end in itself. To an architect, it's a skill set where it's a means. To a film director, it's a means, you know, one should look at Satyajit Ray's uh, diaries of sketches. Amazing. But I think many of us may not even understand the sketches. Sometimes when I go back to my own sketchbook 10 years back, I can't understand the sketch. And I, I'm happy I don't understand because I see something new in it and design something else from it. So I think that's the possibility of a sketch that I can read many meanings, feel inspired each time by it. So the skill set is like Dhoni and Sachin Tendulkar and a cricket team, you know, and each architect then kind of builds that skill set. So I'll come back to Nata. Uh, I would also say that because of the pandemic, Savita, our architecture college has had an open house. We have it very regularly, almost thrice or four times a week. You can come to the campus or you can log on. And we have these kind of Zoom sessions with several parents who have doubts on the NATA eligibility criteria, future prospects. And we've done it only this year because we realized the challenges of the pandemic are beginning to kind of be felt now. You know, even last year, it was not so felt, but I think they're being felt. And therefore, forums like this, which can communicate, the Council of Architecture is also planning several forums now to kind of communicate, to bring a larger awareness before a student decides, I will take architecture. And that's a very important decision. Because once they decide I'm taking architecture, life will unfold in a certain way. So it's good to ask all the questions right now, uh, not kind of segregate between a bad question, good question, clever question or not, but ask all questions at this moment. So we've kept our university open for anyone to walk in at any time, see student work, talk to students, talk to faculty, understand eligibility criteria, and then decide. You know, I think it's very important to have a broader understanding and then decide. You know? So I would state that we have an open house. You can look at our Insta page or anyone who has more 
uh, difficulties or understanding the eligibility criteria, please do uh, ensure that you get all information before registry. Yeah. Thank you, Kamu. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, the analogy worked also. Cricket, right? <laughs> It'll work all the time. So um, that would make, a... I mean, that analogy would make me the twelfth man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So um, we have a question from uh, Dia Madan. Uh, she says, "I want to become an in I want to become an interior designer. Is it better to study architecture than take up a and then take up a course in interior designing, or go straight for the interior designing course?" Um, Shriram, would you like to take this one? Um, she wants I to know if she should do interior architecture and then interior designing, or just straight away go for interior designing. See, I think. Um, an architectural education encompasses a lot of fields of which interior design is one of them. Um, so um, the, the idea is, um, um, I'm not meaning to say that, you know, you're reducing a certain scope or a kind of a profession, but what I mean is that it's like doing a super speciality um, right at the start. So, uh, and often what happens is in interior design, when you only do interior design, there are a lot of aspects of architectural study that, uh, that you don't learn. So, um, you know, uh, architecture is kind of an amalgamation of, I mean, it's, it's been discussed already, but I would just say that it's an amalgamation of creative ability, but it's combined with science and engineering knowledge. Uh, maybe even finance and man management skills, all of them rolled into one. And uh, uh, in order to create the built environment, the environment around us. So uh, interior design is is a it's a subset of this whole thing where you get into a, an already built space and then you look at the uh, at how that can be kind of designed, decorated, and handled. So perhaps it's a good opportunity if you're starting off to do an architectural study and then look at your interests because there are just a wide range of uh, uh, career options that architecture can provide in, under the larger umbrella of architecture. And uh, then you see if your passion for interior design is so strong, you can get into interior design. This is my uh, belief. Though there are courses of interior design that are given in certain schools and colleges. Uh, I, I have, this is a personal bias I have that I feel that an interior designer needs to know certain aspects of engineering, certain aspects. They need to know how the air conditioning works. They need to know how the electrical conduiting moves around. They need to know how the structure is standing there and you know, on what basis they've got the structure, where the plumbing goes. So a lot of this engineering information is important uh, for a person to come out with a really good interior design. They need to uh, you know, appreciate these aspects. So my suggestion would be to do an architectural course and then pursue interior design if you have such a burning desire to be an interior designer with this knowledge that you have gained. Thank you, Ashiram. Uh, uh, Tahir, did you want to add to that? Uh, Shriram somewhat touched uh, on that at the, uh, in his uh, closing remarks about how, uh, so I can speak, say, uh, on uh, from uh, this uh, perspective of our own studio, where when we do an interior design project, I can see how very directly, unless I had certain architectural knowledge and skill, I may not have been doing justice to the interior design scope of work that I had. So I, I do think it really really helps like uh, Shreda mentioned if you have a larger technical uh, understanding of how architecture and how the spaces work in general because then you are much more equipped to do better justice to interior design in my opinion as well and probably I'm sounding uh, equally biased but uh, I, I think that uh, that definitely does uh, help and having said that I also will say that a lot of design specialities like interior design, landscape design, you know, graphic design, whatever it may be, um, from what I've observed and my conversations with other professionals in the field, it's uh, fascinating to see so many amazing creatives mostly working in silos. Uh, 
And I think from that perspective, I am very grateful to be an architect because to some extent, I have got a sneak peek into a lot of other you know, uh, creative spaces. And with that, I then decided to say specialize in urban design, which is uh, my bread and butter today. Uh, and so from that perspective, nothing like architecture to give you maybe a sneak peek into then where you could consider taking you know, your deep dive and then thriving at, uh, or, or you know, becoming extremely good at that, uh, at the highest of levels, that's my opinion. Okay, so architecture and then interior uh, designing. Um, okay, we have a question from an architect in Madurai. Uh, dear sir, I am a uh, architect PRS Sivakumar from Madurai, practicing architecture for the last 40 years. Uh, fresh graduates who are from middle class families are now asking me, uh, are now telling me that they are paid 8,000 to 10,000 rupees only per month, while their friends who did IT degrees are getting 30 to 40,000 rupees a month. So I don't have any convincing answer for them on this, I guess, on the pay payment uh, disparity. I think that's what he, he means. So does anybody want to answer this? I mean, he basically is saying that architects are, I think the graduates are earning much less than IT people in IT. So would anybody like to address this? Question, Professor Durganan. Yeah, I could address this. Uh, I think I had addressed it in the earlier part. I'll bring it back to the fore. Uh, it's also generational. Uh, let let me compare. Let's say with our generation, you know, which I call the Jurassic generation. We were the eighties. We went to uh, college in a certain way. There was no Facebook. We had no distraction of Insta or internet and so we we naturally were drawing we were making and it there was no digital world uh, in the present what we find and now i would say we are immersed in that so we're not as if we were from the jurassic age we are immersed in this new age uh, we begin to find that there are so many varied diverse interests and very fascinating interests and in these interests if we continue to box ourselves. And as Tahir was saying, if we continue to live in small silos, then there's no choice but to have a lesser remuneration. And this is not only of architecture. I can, we can see in IT, we can see in any other uh, area that uh, there, are, there are employment issues, the jobs are not enough, the salaries are not enough. This is prevalent. You know? So I won't limit it to architecture. So, but what has one has to see of the potential of this architecture course, and which is why we request parents and students to really come and start conversing, meet these architects who are doing like, for instance, Sri Ram and Tahir are already there, who have practices which are multi-layered. And what that multi-layered practice does is tomorrow you collaborate with a filmmaker, tomorrow make a film, tomorrow one could do a large infrastructure project. So there are many other avenues for an architect with his five-year course, with this five-year course to build on. So then it's a choice of each architect whether they want to limit and just make one drawing uh, for a developer for one project or does an architect want to kind of unfold and look at all the possibilities, you know. And those architects who have looked at all the possibilities, I'm very sure are on a remunerative scale equal and par of any other profession. And uh, I think the software world also, you know, I was always surprised to find that the software world, the CEO wants to call himself chief architect. And I wonder why he wants to call himself chief architect. And the reason is because that is really the potential of architecture. So if you look at someone who's transformed the nation, they call him, he was the architect of that nation. They never say he was the doctor of the nation or he was a chartered accountant of the nation. We always say he was the architect because there's vision, there's pragmatism, there's a certain uh, need to build a certain uh, framework of how it would unfold collaborate. So there is a conversation with people. So it, it, is, it is a very uh, I always say there's high freedom in this profession. But high freedom needs to be, uh, I would say, accepted. I may be free and decide to sit at home 
tying myself in chains. So I think freedom needs to be uh, accepted, appropriated, and those architects who've really gone, you know, just so I just say, enjoy the freedom, immerse in it. Let's not get bound by rules. And I think the opportunities are vast. The opportunities are vast. And all the colleagues whom we have and the architects who visit our campus uh, would would uh, vouch for it even in their own practices. I, by that, I'm not trying to wish away the fact that there are challenges, there are risks. Uh, of course, there. You know, anything I set up, if I set up any industry, there's a challenge, there's a risk. So what we've done now in our own course in architecture is right from the first year, we are exposing the students to balance sheets, to financial risk, which rarely happens in an architecture course. But we thought, let's do it. And in a very gaming way, it's not done with the stress of, it's done as a game. And uh, I think at the end of five years, today, let's say the, the Notre Dame uh, had caught fire you know, in Paris. Now they are dependent on video games to rebuild the Notre Dame. So I think the game Assassin's Creed has now become one of the references to rebuild Notre Dame. So you can imagine, and that was again created by an architect. He created a game and the game is, it's a billion dollar industry. And uh, you find like, for instance, Sapienza University has now collaborated with our university and the proofs is coming. They've done an amazing augmented reality model of Rome, the whole of Rome uh, in the second century. So it's not only research, they're getting such a high traction on tourism which again is an industry uh, which I would say is very remunerative. And for some reason, there are not enough architects who ventured into it because they've not realized their role in that. But I think if we look at it, there are, there are many possibilities. And those are the possibilities we are opening up during the pandemic and even pre-pandemic. So I agree, the conventional talk uh, has always been that the remuneration is low when they come out. And that has a lot of, it's, it's, a, it's a seminar, a full day seminar in itself. So I won't attempt it in five minutes. Uh, but uh, I think that's a separate story, which we would bring up at some point in time. And that is more a reflection that architects, the fraternity, the council, the universities need to do. But that's a separate story. But I personally see we have not had these problems. All my batchmates, I can vouch are uh, enjoying their course in different ways. Someone is in landscape, someone in wildlife, someone in photography, someone in, and I think that nuancing that this course allows. So each time we have an alumni meet, we're just engrossed on what the other person is into and you know what they're doing. And it's, it's marvelous. So somebody's already in Andes, someone is documenting Antarctica, someone. Is, so when we talk, it's like someone was the secretary of a, Home Minister in Finland now. And uh, we are just looking at what kind of options. I have another batchmate who is now the advisor to the Prime Minister in Canada. And you just listen and you're fascinated with what this course has opened. And uh, so I think that's what we need to focus on. And if all of us kind of relook at it, and I think the pandemic gives us this opportunity, uh, then I think all this will, because this is a question, a very important question. It comes up again and again and again. I've heard it for 30 years now. And I think we need to have a full day or a two day seminar. If the Times is open for it, it will be a great seminar. It will have a big draw. I'll, I'll respond to this also. I mean, uh, because uh, since we are in practice and we also face this problem. Um, uh, see, architecture is a profession. Like you, you've got doctors, uh, doctors, when they graduate and they go out to work, they don't earn a very high salary. Um, likewise, lawyers, chartered accountants. So uh, the thing is, even though ours is a five-year course, it's a designated five-year course, there is still a lot of learning that happens. So uh, though we do have a, a, a six-month or a one-year internship, what really happens is you have almost a three-year internship. Uh, so, you know, when you finish your study of architecture, you come out, you need to really find your feet. You need to understand what is it that I'm interested in, what 
uh, which career path in architecture am I going to take? Am I going to end up setting up a practice, a design practice? Because you know, it's a it's actually a small percentage of architects who study architecture who end up uh, setting up shop as an architect, as a designing practice in architecture. Many of them diversify. So uh, the people who stick on in architecture to do design. Uh, their remuneration is not going to be great in terms of money, but their intention is that I am going to set up a practice of my own. And that is when I'm going to start making my money. The same happens with the chartered accountant, same happens with a, with a medical doctor or a lawyer. Because if they have to set up their own practice, there's a whole lot of things they need to learn more than what is taught academically. That whole wealth of experience has to, it takes time, it's a function of time. So the graph perhaps is that you, you'll make your money, but it's after a period of time and then the graph starts to climb. Perhaps in IT, the graph starts taking off right at the beginning. And then it probably flattens out unless you qualify yourself more and make yourself more useful to the uh, company or to your profession. And then is when uh, you need to, then, then, then's when probably your salary graph would rise. But in uh, architecture, if, if you want to set up a practice, it is going to be a slow graph. Salaries will be low. I think what Shivakumar, uh, Mr. Shivakumar has said is very true, but it is in the short term. You cannot compare architectural uh, education and practice and a practitioner to an IT professional. No way that they're completely different. So uh, I think there is a, it's a function of time. After a particular time, it goes up. And then there are people who say, look, this architecture profession, getting into architecture, into design is going to take a long time for me to make some money. I want to make some more money. I want to make it relevant. There are so many options that you can uh, diversify into and uh, make your money there. So uh, <clears throat> I think the common mistake that we make uh, is that we assume that architecture is also in, the, in one of those cubby holes of professions where you need to graduate, you come out, and then you immediately get a salary, which is so much, and then it goes up so much and so on. No, it doesn't work that way. It is what you put in and what is your value in that. That is your probably your remuneration is uh, proportionate to what you give to, your, to the profession. So the amount of time, effort, and uh, value you bring into your work. So, uh, yeah. oh, no, sorry, sorry, Sri Ramgur. No, no, that's it. I, I just want to give you a... Uh, uh, Tahir, did you want to add to that? Yeah, it's a small continuation of what uh, Sri Ram was mentioning, which is that also when it's about setting up a practice, architecture is beautiful in the sense that you can be a one-man or one-woman show. You can choose to have a large company with you know, 200, 500 plus people. You can have a global practice with offices in, in key locations all over the world. So uh, that's the beauty of this profession, which not all professions uh, uh, can even you know, uh, manage. And I think uh, that's another uh, aspect that you know, everyone should really think of in terms of the, when they think about you know, the monetary angle and so on, which is that there are, this entire spectrum is there in front of you and it's up to you to decide. And on a personal level, I can still say till today, it's been 11 years. Every day I am learning, architecturally speaking. Uh, uh, I know that all of us are learning, uh, you know, from the ecosystem around us, but even till today, I, I feel like I am still in training. Um, luckily, my remuneration is a little better but uh, I, I still feel that. And I think it's a constant uh, evolution through time. And like Sriram pointed out much uh, early on, and this is why I love this conversation, if I can be candid, um, is that the, the, the uh, idea is that you always want to do better than what you did yesterday from a design perspective. And I think that's what constantly keeps your mind, you know, thinking about what you can do better or what, what you've learned from something that didn't happen as well as you'd like and then improve upon it. So over time as well, you really mature as a professional, whether it is practicing architecture formally or whether it's something that architecture has then put you into in, as a career. 
Okay. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Tahir. Um, just one question to, uh, I mean, Tahir, maybe we could just start with this. How has the pandemic sort of challenged the profession? Um, the profession or the uh, academic I mean, uh, aspect yeah, of... Both of it, both, both, architecture as a whole. So uh, uh, as far as our practice goes, I think we were very, very fortunate that we had a significant amount of say production that needed to be done in the last, uh, as, as soon as the first lockdown was announced. So, and, and by then as a team, we had built a great synergy. We have a very small studio, it's uh, about 15 of us in total. And there was great synergy. So that transition felt a little easier than maybe uh, uh, other cases. And we had enough of production work to kind of keep all of us as a team collectively busy for a significant amount of time. Obviously, a lot of our projects came to a complete standstill. So we optimized that uh, you know, time to, to get a lot of this done. And now slowly, you know, things are getting back on their feet. Our projects are restarting. Some of them that were nearing completion are getting complete. So that's on the professional side of things. As far as academia goes, I have had the good fortune to be involved with a few uh, colleges uh, you know, through reviews and uh, juries, but I definitely think Durganan should answer this this yeah. question very specifically. I feel like the personal, this is my personal opinion, the uh, fact that uh, movement itself has been restricted and hindered did take a toll on the course itself because the course is greatly dependent on you engaging with your surroundings, you know, immersing yourself in your surroundings. So for instance, if you have been asked to design a project in XYZ area, the idea is that you get a holistic understanding of the region and then the, you know, the area and then the site and then actually get into, you know, the process of design. And I noticed that because movement was hindered, the holistic understanding to some degree in some of the studios that I was part of felt lacking a little bit. And again, my personal view is that uh, there is nothing like a face-to-face conversation, a face-to-face -face interaction, especially if we are ideating. If I need to sit and scribble on the same piece of paper, I know virtual formats now allow for all of this and more. Uh, maybe I'm old school that way. I, I can qualify for the dinosaur era a little bit to some degree, but uh, I, I, I personally miss that a little bit, but I'm sure I think even technology may find its own way to enable this in a manner where you don't feel that lacking. And having said that, the great thing that I felt was the colleges that I was uh, part of, uh, it would be impossible for me to, uh, you know, have been part of them given where I'm located. So that was something that was exciting. So I was also learned, uh, you know, I was working with colleges that are not accessible easily from our city. And so that opened up a new avenue. So what we had uh, certain limitations to, this virtual pandemic era has also opened up other opportunities too. And I mean, I'm gonna end, uh, I know we are short of time, I'm gonna end on one last note. For instance, we do a lot of heritage walks and this is a byproduct of a lot of the conversations that we've had today. And a lot of these heritage walks are physical walks, of course. But what we've noticed is uh, through the pandemic, we had to adapt and evolve. We, uh, all our walks came to a grinding halt. So we went virtual. And what is beautiful about that is exactly what I mentioned earlier, which is we had people from Scotland and you know, all over the world kind of being interested in understanding what's happening in this beautiful little city of ours. So I felt like there is there, there are two sides to that coin always, in my opinion. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Professor Durganath, would you like to add anything to this? How the pandemic has sort of challenged maybe the course itself? Yes, I'll just be brief. Because what we've done is, see, we first tried to assess what is the inflection that has happened across the world? We needed to analyze that. And I think this is a moment in history which has never happened before. I agree most of us are taking it very uh, business as normal. We think one mask put across solves the issues. But I think there is a dramatic shift right now which has happened where pre-pandemic, if we discussed with most, even on a Saturday, Sunday, they were out at the beach or they were at the mall or they were driving. So we had 
a city which had traffic jam, there were people in the resort or driving out, and maybe an empty home. I'm just being provocative. The homes were empty and the cities and the urban space was packed. Now we have a situation, the homes are completely packed and the cities are empty, absolute inversal. So which means where we are living today is not home. Where I'm living today is now my uh, seminar conference room with Times of India. Uh, it is my cultural center. Uh, it is my talk with my friend. It is my classroom. It is so suddenly the home uh, has dissolved. And the home has become the city. The home has become the region. The home has become the cultural center, the home. So my shopping mall becomes maybe Amazon and Flipkart and XYZ. But what has happened is that if we take that into account, and that's what we did, we inverted our entire pedagogy where the student now re-looks at where he's inhabiting and just doesn't look at it at home as well. And because we did that, we had the grandmother coming into the class now, which would have never happened. Uh, we had the grandmother from the Northeast coming in, talking to us about Northeast in 1920. So we gave, we, so suddenly we have a grandmother, uh, a grandfather, 92 year old grandfather in Kerala talking to us about the Nalkat and what he did. So suddenly the classroom has got broken its boundaries. It's become limitless and we are having a conversation. And because there's a risk of losing the reality, the five senses, what we started doing is that if let's say we had a history class and they were studying a home in Rome, the student had to stick with tape and build the Roman house, of course, with parental permissions within the home. So suddenly the student thinks that the whole family is now living in a Roman house and he gets a scale of the Roman house. He believes that his house is half the size of a Roman house or twice the size of a Roman house. So it doesn't become something as ephemeral as a screen, because if it is only digital, I would say it's next to impossible to impart architecture. So we converted the digital into the tactile and we had the benefit now of architects. We have a talk series and it's open to all free of cost where there are 100 architects from around the world. Tahir presented last week and we hope Sriram will present soon. 100 architects from around the world have consented to speak on this forum and we've already finished about 20 of them. And it's a very enriched forum of discussions from Ukraine, Paraguay, now, if not for the uh, pandemic, I don't think we could have conjured such a series. And uh, so it's a combination. It's a combination. And whenever the lockdown is removed, we do steal a few meetings with the students and, of course, with social distancing and all those norms. But we do steal because the real face-to-face, -face, I don't think as human beings so easily we can substitute. The day we all become cyborgs, maybe we can. Uh, but today, as human beings, I'm, I'm an advocate of let's meet, let's enjoy, let's have tea together and let's study architecture. And I think that's, that's the beginning. A plan B is the digital space. And I'm not an advocate for making plan B, plan A, at least in architecture. And I feel that combination, it's a combination of the real, the experiential. So when it rains, I tell my students, go to the terrace and get wet in the rain, but don't get a cold. But what happens is they're not stuck to the digital realm. They're feeling the rain. They're touching the mud. They're watching the rain in their compound and understanding topography. They're, I give them assignments like they have to write the names of the leaves in their garden. They didn't even know there were trees in their garden because they were so busy running, coming back, and you know, traveling. So I think that reconnection with nature, that conversation with cultures across, that's what we've done in the last one year. And it's, it's having... I would say uh, very uh, enlightening results, very early to judge outcomes. But uh, now we have the Venice School of Architecture, Auckland, Nepal, Barcelona, or University of Washington. Right now there's a Jerusalem studio, next week there's South, uh, South Africa, all connecting with us to understand these processes because the digital alone seems to have failed across the world. I would, I would state it, it has failed. So we need to look at these new processes that combine experiential, 
the five senses, the limitations of lockdown, and the promise of the digital. And I think if we do that, if we need to rethink the course, rethink how we're doing it, uh, I do see some possibility. I'm not saying it's the best. It is the next best. But within the next best, I think as human beings, and especially as architects, we can reinvent. Because that's the primary role of an architect is to reimagine. Uh, not accept uh, any uh, compromise or a limitation, but to reimagine uh, a certain promise within what we're. So we're talking about future cities, we're going into the villages. So I think all that energy is there you know, to imagine creatively, but it needs connection with the real. It needs collection with. So we tell them if you don't have clay in the house, please request your mom and take. Uh, atta, chapati, atta, and make a model and let's see. So they're doing it. And uh, so there is a tactileness to it. So we need to rethink sometimes out of the box and they're enjoying it. They're enjoying it because it's a stick model. They can't get bamboo. They may use vermicelli or something like that to make something. But I think it's very, very doable. And suddenly you find the home has become the laboratory. What we took for granted in the modern world has now become the laboratory. And if we relook at the home as a laboratory, I think the possibilities are unlimited. You know? And then it builds our own resilience. It tests our resilience. It asks how much can we take. It uh, tests how can we be happy with the frugal also at times. It tests so many other things. And every day the students are surprising me with something or the other. And then you realize there was so much in the human mind and architecture that we can discuss. And uh, that doesn't mean there's no stress. That doesn't mean you're not depressed because you couldn't go out to the forum mall or the beach. All that is there. But we need to find other alternatives to discover this. And in finding the alternative, I think the challenge comes. So thank you very much, Kami. And I have to thank the thank Sriram and Tahir for an amazing conversation, given us a lot of thoughts to go back to the university and think more on this. And so thank you very much. So uh, before we wrap up, Sriram, any words of advice for budding architecture students? Anything you'd like to say before we end? Well, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, a field of education which is uh, like any other. You know, it, is, it is quite different. And you need to first accept that it is a different field of education, which has creativity, has science and technology, engineering, humanities, a whole lot of humanities involved, finance, man management, public speaking, and, uh, and so on. So um, as a career, it's, it's very, very enriching. And uh, it, it gives you a, a good perspective of of life itself, what Dukkanam has been saying and uh, Tahir as well. Um, uh, you don't, like sometimes when you get into IT, your job is just uh, go do your job, meet your targets and um, achieve whatever numbers you have set out to do, collect your money and then go back, go out with your family, eat and then watch a movie, play some games and then that's it. Life is uh, kind of uh, it motors along. Whereas for an architect, you would you would go on a road and you would say, "Why is the road this wide? Why is it that uh, we have shops on this side? Why do we have beggars over here? Why is the road uh, crossing like this? Where is the metro going? Why is the metro coming this way? Uh, why is this garden uh, not so good? Why do we have why don't we have more trees here? Why are the people so insensitive?" Or why is this person being so uh, careful while crossing the road? Is there something wrong with him, visually impaired? I mean, you tend to look at a whole lot of things which uh, you probably are trained to do in a, in a very uh, uh, subconscious manner. An architect is more aware of the environment, his, his or her surroundings, and uh, you know, your, your everything around you, you are more aware of it. And you have a direct um, 
responsibility to shape the environment around you. You put up a building, you put up a space that did not exist before. And it is not, it is not virtual, but it is real. So, uh, so that's a huge responsibility. You're putting up a school, it's for the children who are going to learn that generations of children are going to learn that. So you better do a good job. That you know, it, it becomes a conducive uh, environment for learning, for kids to grow happily. So uh, they don't, it's not a sweatshop, it's not that they're sweating all the time. There's a lot of light, there's a lot of air, there's a lot of uh, you know, freedom for people to move around. So it's not claustrophobic, it's all open. So the responsibility of a designer is there. It's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work, but it's very different from any other profession. So that's something we really need to get in our heads. The parents need to realize that if the children are getting into architecture, uh, you need to give them a longer rope. If you say, no, no, I want them to do only engineering, there is a lot of engineering in architecture. If you say, no, no, I want them to do more humanities-based studies, you know, we, the amount of history and geography and uh, uh, things that we learn, uh, English in public speaking, I don't think any other course really teaches that much. And then there is creativity, there is the environment. We are the ones talking, shouting ourselves hoarse about, you know, uh, what's going to happen 20 years later, how much water do we have, there is a water scarcity, it is so hot, can we design our buildings in a better manner that, you know, we don't need to use up so much energy. So which other profession teaches you all these things or makes you aware of all these things? So this is, this is the whole thing. You know? So uh, it's a very global subject and uh, you need to realize that you're getting into something like this, which is very different. It's not a textbook course. It's not something that I can just pick up five books and I re read it all and I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer or I'm a chartered accountant. No, it doesn't work that way. So, uh, so that's what it is. So, uh, uh, take up architecture, enjoy yourself. That's all I would say, and uh, experience it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Professor Durganan, Sriram, and Tahir. Thank you so much for joining in. And uh, to all the future architects, we hope this session provided the insights you were looking for to build a career in the field. So thank you and goodbye from all of us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Are we off the air? Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. This was wonderful. I